Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Voxology Podcast. Mike Erie, Tim Stafford. We've got a whole bunch of things to catch up on. First of all, I have I have um, food in my teeth, so I've got to take care of that. Secondly, <laughs> Seth Erie today, I was just telling Tim, Seth Erie today, we had Special Olympics, um, yes, two days ago. Seth Erie rocking the softball throw and the 100-meter dash. And by rocking, I mean finishing. So, um, and and then today he has it's called the 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 Grove Games. He goes to a, a little school uh, named Poplar Grove, and so the Grove Games is where they honor the whole school honors the the Special Olympic athletes. And at the end of that um, honoring, Seth Erie is going to perform Josh <laughs> Groban's "You Lift Me Up." Yeah. Which is so, going to have to end up on our Instagram. Just, oh my goodness! FYI, I mean, he was so he's been he's been preparing for this forever. And 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 if you know our little dude, if you're new to the podcast, my, my 15 year old son is named Seth. He has Down syndrome, and he is um, he's the closest thing we have to a rock star <laughs> on the Voxology podcast. And he will have the entire school up and waving their arms. And it will be magnificent. So that's coming. So I've got a I've got a firm hour for our podcast today. Um, you, we have we we got to talk about the nonference a little bit. But you went to see Pearl Jam in Sacramento, and yep, there it is, Red Mosquito, dude. Well done. So and we haven't talked. I mean, you just texted set lists and oh photographs with you and Eddie Vedder, and <laughs> and oh I just I just talked to Mike McCready, and I mean I mean. You know, I'm just sitting there going, really, really, bro, really, really. Um, just give me a, give me, just give me something from that whole night. Like, well, all that stuff happened like, kind of last minute. Or we had a hookup that came through like the last second, and so it was fortuitous to say the least. But it was a great night, words. so fun. Yeah, shook hands with I think every member of the band that night. And then the Eddie thing was very last minute. We were already already on the floor. And then I saw um, my wife's dad, who is Eddie's uncle, um, over by the security gate. So I just grabbed a couple people and ran over there and just followed him back. But it was fun. It was like ours, our son Elliot, pretty much his. He we took him to yeah yeah yeahs, but this was his first like in the middle of the fray mm. show, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and it was a blast. They're so good. Oh my goodness. We were down by the stage and they were going bananas. Although they. <laughs> They messed up the opening to Faithful. I think Mike's guitar was in the wrong tuning, and they could not find it. <laughs> they just oh, kind of like funny. pushed through it, and it sounded terrible. But <laughs> otherwise, so much fun. Oh, you deserve it. They're the you best. You deserve happiness. Did you listen to last week's episode where we were doing mental health, and you weren't there because mm-hmm. I had said I announced you had no problems. <laughs> we're sick of you being perfect. Yeah, yeah, which is all true. I established yeah, that in therapy this week. Nice. Oh yeah, yeah. What was your what was your uh, what was your therapy this week? Man, she was so, like, and, and, yeah. She was kind of, you know, I've talked about how I kind of scored off the chart on empathy, and um, mm-hmm. and that, that's not a brag a bragging thing. It's an unhealthy thing. <laughs> just to be clear, it's not a flex. Yeah, it's not a flex. Um, this week she was kind of like, she's like, I, she's like, I um. She's like, I was thinking about you and I'm trying to figure out, she's like, you are, I, long story short, I walk into a room, I was talking about the nonference and I walk into a room and I don't even have to know what's happening. I start absorbing like trauma or things in the room without Mm. knowing it. And I was like, I don't Mm. understand what that means. That sounds like magic. Like I understand Mm -hmm. a practical thing. I hear stories. I take them on. But absorbing stuff in a room seems crazy. And yeah. how do you combat something like that? So that was a, a bulk of our therapy was working through kind of what that looks like and how to be healthy and mm. learning how to just exit when I got the heebie-jeebies and yeah. stuff like that. So yeah. it was very, it's yeah. great. I love mm-hmm. it. She's the best therapist. I'm learning so much at this point in my life that I wish I would have learned 30 years oh. ago. Like so just true, really, dude. it would have been so helpful so for my thirties and twenties and stuff, but yeah. I'm thankful that at least now I'm getting a lot of that stuff. Yeah. Yeah. She's amazing. Your 50s, you're hearing it. That's so great. Um, 
I love that. And I'm happy for therapy and I'm happy for Pearl Jam therapy. That's right. Um, the non-ference was ridiculous. It was <laughs> what 17 people who was, I mean, who were incredibly vulnerable and we just did so much hard work and sharing and tears and healing. And how do you sum it up? I don't even, I have, I've had to sum it up a few times in the last two weeks. How do you like, if someone says like, Hey, how was it? There's no, it's impossible to answer. (laughs) Um, I I don't know. How do you, how do you summarize uh, being privileged into people's stories and, um, and, you know, and their willingness. Yeah. Bearing witness to the pain and disappointment. And then, you know, privilege to play a small part in maybe tasting what health could look like or whatever. It's just, yeah. it's just awesome. It's so hard. It's like, it's like re, we, the goal is we, we rehumanize. Uh, we try to rehumanize vocational and non-vocational ministry. That was, that was great. We had a couple of folks there that aren't even in like they, they aren't even paid by Christian organizations and, and they found it super helpful. So I just want to say again to all of our listeners, thank you. Um, that this has been such an unexpected, amazing thing. We've had what 36 people go through it or something. Um, 34, 32, 30 something, just kind of like Tim's age. And, um, and it's been amazing. So man, we're totally blessed. I also did, I did a little holy post, little holy post uh, thing at our church. Uh, May 9th, we, um, we had a guy named David French, another guy, Sky Jatani, another guy, Mike Erie. Another guy, John Houghton, who's the CEO of Holy Post. We did a little confab, and um, and it was fun. So that was love them and love being a part of the stuff that they're doing. And and it's funny there are loads the overlap of Holy Post listeners and Boxology listeners. There's significant overlap, um, and yeah, it really is. It really is a lot of fun. So I'm, I appreciate being included in all of that. Um, so yeah, we had uh, we did a little mental health stuff last episode. Before that, we had a little not pre nonference nonference, <laughs> and um, we're back today, Tim. We're, we're back all over the place in being human. Exactly. Um, can you hear that? What is that? <laughs> that's. I think that's our washer or dryer or something. I don't know. <laughs> Here we we're go. Back. <laughs> we're back. We're back. There's one, there's one scarring episode of the dryer, the dryer. Episode. Not just one. That's that was like three there. or four in a row. It's just every time. It's like, oh. that's so amazing. I mean, I mean, I just, if people wonder, like, does laundry get done? Yes, it does. It does. It just in case does. everyone was worried. So, so we're, we're working our way through Genesis and we got to the word rule. And, oh, wait, let me ask um, that question I wanted to ask you real quick. Oh, yeah, before you... form. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, I've gotten a lot. So when we were at the non that was something that came up quite a bit. And I was worried that that word cruciform, um, yeah. some people were taking it as like a martyrdom um, yes. kind of idea. And then since the non-friends, so I tried to talk to people in our kind of one-on-one spiritual direction things uh, to try to diffuse that a little bit and play around with the definition some. Um, and then I've gotten a few more questions since then, like how, like, I don't understand this idea of cruciform, mm. like, it, and it comes up mm. so often. So I thought if we could spend like two minutes or something just trying to translate or give a really helpful kind of layman's term for what cruciform means. So when that word comes up, what do we mean by that? Yes, that's a great question. And yeah, just for a little context, you know, the, the phrase deny yourself, take up your cross and follow me has been used by people to... Uh, harm and abuse other people or keep them at least in abusive situations by saying, you know, it's part of denying yourself or whatever. So cruciform, the word means in the shape of the cross. And so it's cross shaped. So it's not just that Jesus did something on the cross, but the cross, his, his life orientated to the cross is actually a pattern for people to follow. So it's not just that Jesus did something on the cross and then great, I don't have to have anything to do with it outside of, you know, choosing it as jewelry. It's that that's the, that's a pattern of life. And Paul summarizes this pattern of life by quoting an early creed or hymn, probably in Philippians two, where, 
He says, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking out to your own interests, but um, each of you to the interests of others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset. So this is the cruciform mindset as Christ Jesus, who, being God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to its own advantage. Mm. Rather, he made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant and being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. So cruciformity is the pattern where the rights, the privileges, the prerogatives we have as part of being, you know, you or me or whoever else, we, we set those aside and do not use them for our own advantage. Uh, so though Jesus was God and had all the rights, prerogatives, power of God, he set that aside and did not use it for his own advantage. But instead, he almost emptied himself of that. And then, and then there's this gradation of he became... Um, a servant, but not just any kind of servant. He came as a human, but not just any kind of human. He came as somebody who was crucified on a cross, like the, like it's layers of social shame. And and when the writer says even becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross, that is the most socially shameful right. place in Roman society. There is no, there's nothing lower than a person nailed to a cross in terms of social honor. So so we're capturing the move from the place of highest social prestige, power, and privilege to the place of lowest social prestige, privilege, and that Jesus chose that willingly. And so, so, and God, in response to that emptying, God exalted him to the highest place. So he, now he's back. He's now back exalted and gave him the name that is above every name. This is a reference to Isaiah in the name of Yahweh. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven, on earth, and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So, so, so what Paul, you know, is taking from this hymn, okay, guys, um, in the way that you relate to each other, be humble. Well, what's that look like? Mm-hmm. Well, um, uh, look out for the interests of others. Well, okay, well, what's that look like? Well, Jesus gives us a great example. All right, well, what was that example? Well, he had all the rights and social privileges, but he didn't use them for his own advantage. Rather, he used them, right, as and he self-expended them for the sake of other people. And so in his self-expenditure, Paul says, he then receives the name of Yahweh. And that means that this is what Yahweh's heart is like. Mm-hmm. This idea that Yahweh comes and Yahweh self-expends rights and privileges and powers for the sake of the other. That's Yahweh kind of life or cruciform life. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. So, so when we talk about um, living a cruciform life, we we come bundled um, as a set of experiences, strengths, talents, bank accounts, whatever. It is the fundamental orientation of our life, self-preservation and self-exaltation. Right. So I'm just using those things to my own advantage. Right. Or is the fundamental orientation self-expenditure and um, and siblingship towards the other that I'm lifting the other. And and that's like fundamentally, that's the question. Now, that doesn't mean like deny yourself doesn't mean stop being yourself. Right. But it means not using your own power, privilege, possessions, prerogatives, what any other P words we can come up with for your own advantage, but rather using them and leveraging them for the sake of the other. Make sense? Yeah. So it's, it's assuming a downward social trajectory so that others may assume, uh, assume a higher social trajectory. And when, when, when people do that in the name of Jesus, they bear the name Yahweh. Yeah. They're given the name above every name. Yeah. Yeah. Cause I think people really are leaning into the, this idea. And so, you know, when it comes to like this idea of American Christians are very persecuted, yada, 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 everything comes down right. to this idea of, a, of being a martyr and being like, whatever, right. but that even that in its own way becomes confrontational. 
And so it's like, well, we're really missing the mark on this idea. It's such so much more of a, a fully encompassing posture than it is just like be willing to die for your belief. Uh, yes. Does that make sense? Because I think that's where the discrepancy oh. has been happening. Yes, I. that's so good, Tim. Yeah, deny yourself, take up your cross, follow me does not mean be willing to die for your belief. Someone puts a gun to your head. I, for me, it, it's much harder than that. Yeah. Like that's the easy step. The hard step is um, not claiming your rights and not using power for your own purposes or not, you know, not trying to... Um, can you hear all that? A little bit. <laughs> okay. Let's try it again. No, that's bacon. So I was encouraging my family to be quiet. <laughs> so now we're cooking bacon. Boxology is all about just being in the home together, oh, folks. Oh my lord, yes. Um, so so yeah, that this isn't about about, about being a doormat or yeah. staying in situations that are abusive or anything like that. Rather, it's an orientation that simply says. With with everything that you've been given, is the goal more or is the goal self expenditure? Yeah. You know, for the sake of other and and that not self expenditure to the point because this could even be abused. Self expenditure to the point we had someone at the nonference who was told to self expend into oblivion yeah. until they ceased being their own person. That's not yeah. what this is. No, Jesus was very very clearly self expended, but then took time by himself with the Father. To relax with his disciples, he retreated. You know all the things that that you know talk, that are required for being healthy. So cruciformity, um, and and, Which and, is I, huge. and I find that's huge. It's huge, absolutely. It, it's it's not it's not martyrdom as you're saying, but rather it's it's. Do I look out on life and do I see a? Um, do I see a world of scarcity where I have to hoard and promote and self-exalt? Or do I see a world or at least a God of abundance, bounty, blessing, where I can give away, raise up others, you know, self-expend without fear of um, yeah. losing whatever I have? Man, it'd be interesting and, to pick that apart too, the provision, not today, obviously, but what, what you just said about the bounty and provision that God offers, even that is a, a cliche to a certain extent amongst. Of course. So it's like, what does that actually mean when you look out at the world and you look at your life? And you don't have to answer this now, but I think it'd be an interesting thing to pick at. It's another rhetorical device that we have that has lost mm -hmm. context mm -hmm. or full yeah. understanding or meaning. And it's now just a thing like, well, God provides. Yeah. How? What? When? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. What does that yeah, look yeah. like? Yeah, exactly right. And, and when I say, when I use those words, I don't mean his provision, right? Because that part, I don't know. I mean, I, I can say in America, oh yeah, God provides. But then you've got someone in the Sudan who um, doesn't, isn't quite sure of their next meal. And that's God the Lord's provides. prayer, right? And then we've picked that apart a bit. You love picking. I do, but I love the plural picking aspect of that, like, you know. Give us to stay our daily bread. I've got my daily bread. Who does not? Right. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So so when I talk about abundance, Dallas Willard just has a line that that has always shook me. D. Willie. You know, D. Willie. Um, do you believe that you are safe in God's good world? Huh. And <laughs> if safe, but, 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 but truly if safe means mm -hmm. safely nestled in God's kingdom and under his care, then the answer is yes. Mm. If safe means perfectly provided for forever without struggle or need or disappointment, well then, man, are we, we Oof. in for it at that point? There's a lot right. there Oof. in that though. Wow. Right. Right. And so, so when Jesus, I mean, cause, cause remember Jesus is teaching all of this to disciples who he keeps telling are going to be persecuted. Right. And they're yes. going to lose everything. Right? He keeps telling them in the midst of that. And so so Jesus is nowhere ever and this is this is really what wars against our consumeristic tendencies more than anything. Cruciformity is the opposite of capitalism. Your right, cruciformity is the self-expenditure of goods and services rather than the accumulation of goods and services. And, and I know people will say, yeah, yeah, but I gotta, I gotta, you know, collect goods and services in order to give them away and find whatever. 
Um, but when we're talking about tangibly what cruciformity looks like, it, it, is, it is the desire to see others honored. It's the desire to see others lifted up. It's the desire to see others taken care of. It's the desire to see others um, well received. And you know what I mean? It's, yeah. that's the, it's just a, it's a, an entire orientation and it's so much bigger. Like dying for Jesus is easy. Living for Jesus is the hard part. Yeah. Um, and so being cruciform in your marriage isn't claiming your rights and naming, you know, all the things that you deserve, but it's rather seeking to build the other up. I mean, it's all the things. And I know all of that can get turned into cliche, but when we talk about the pattern of the cross, it's very easy to make that just a religious thing yeah. or, uh, just to make it a trite sort of, um, you know, yeah, you really should be nice to other people and care about them rather than this really radical orientation of, I don't always, and Jesus hints at this all the time. Like he tells a, a parable about, he notices how people sit at, at a banquet he's at. And, um, and he's like, guys, when you sit at a banquet, don't go sitting at that place of highest social honor. Someone else might show up and you might be dishonored and go to the lowest place. Instead, choose the lowest place of honor. And if someone exalts you from there, great, but you don't, you're not entitled to it. Right. And I mean, so he's constantly, he's, yeah, he's constantly playing out these social dynamics that, you know, in, in America, we think we're so sophisticated because no one cares, you know, about where we sit, but then it's like, ah, we kind of do in a lot of places. Oh, yeah. So all that is to say, Jesus Th this idea that the cross isn't something that Jesus did on our behalf, but rather also not, not, or, but is also a pattern for us to follow, man, that's, that's, that's when you get into the revolution. Yeah. You and I think I mean? that's, like, I was that's... trying to talk to somebody. I was like, for me, the way that I've been internalizing this lately has been like the love your enemy has been really heavy on me. And who is mm -hmm. my enemy? Well, my enemy tends to mostly be people from the tribe that I grew up in. Mm -hmm. and, and it's where I get the most angry and the most cynical and that kind of stuff. But mm -hmm. practicing, mm -hmm. you know, and when we were doing Easter and I was talking about like how counter Jesus, uh, the, the entire cross was just because of the fact that the normal, the normal narrative was revenge. It was to avenge, mm -hmm. like, so avenge this death, avenge this person, riot, um, you know, calling your people to stand up and take to honor your death or mm -hmm. to whatever and how opposite Jesus was with yeah. all of that, where it was like praying yeah. on their behalf. They don't know what they're doing, reaching totally. out to the people next to him, really like telling his followers to do a very opposite route from that point. Mm -hmm. And just how yeah. we lose, how counterintuitive that was to that time period, even this time totally. period, but especially that time period. And so yeah. modeling this idea of even at that point on the cross, and then everything before that, that he kind of talked about, what does it mean if, the, if that road was always leading there? What does it really mean to take up your cross within that context of everything that he was talking yeah. about and, and, and yeah. being, you know, everything? So I think that's yeah. really helpful. I just I, there are so many conversations I've had where people are like, I don't get this idea because it just seems like totally, totally. But so hopefully that's helpful. Yep. Yeah, bro. I love that you brought it up. It's it's. You know, it's relinquishing your rights. It's um, foregoing entitlements. It's uh, walking into a situation and not putting yourself in the center of the the social universe. I mean, the entitlement just, you know, thing is like that is the. I was talking to somebody the other day. I was like, I think entitlement right now is the my, the thing that infuriates me the most. Mm, and and I and I'm mm, saying that from a position that I understand the position that I'm in as a white straight christian male in the united states of america like i have Bearded. the chief entitlements across the board for Freckled. watching people really like everything that i see one of the main reasons i get so frustrated with the church is because of this weird entitlement that they have is like mm. this is a christian mm. nation we are the christians therefore right. this is our right. nation and you will right. you have to do what we do and we're just seeing yeah. that whether it's you know yeah. Kansas City Chiefs well, kicker yeah. or whatever, like they're all, it's this weird sense of entitlement over like what it means to be whatever, yeah. I don't know, whatever you think you deserve or you've earned by being born the way you were born is just wild. Yeah, it really is against, yeah, yeah. The, 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 the idea that somehow 
we're owed Christian culture or we're owed, I mean, the, all of the questing for status and power goes against this. It's like royal birth, um, right, or something. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and that's, man, what a great transition, Tim. Um, <laughs> royal birth. Because we were born to rule, my oh, friend. Oh, there we go. And and as opposed to Bruce Springsteen's Born to Run. Some we're of us professionals, were guys. Run. Don't try this. Don't try podcasting at home. Don't like try this. this at home. At home. <laughs> literally at home. <laughs> Um, <laughs> so, so we've been, we've, we've kind of, we've kind of, and per usual, the snail's pace, <laughs> uh, we, we made our way through like two verses. And so we're stuck on rule and, and you, you raised as always the, the best question, which is, okay, so what's rule mean? And, and, and we argued initially that rule, that rule meant for the human to rule in the way that Yahweh did and that Yahweh ruled in a really interesting way in Genesis and throughout the text. And then we, we wanted to spend a little more time talking about rule because culturally or in Christian culture, there's, there's kind of this understanding of power that says, listen, all there is is power and it, and all power is power over. And so the key is to get good people in good cultures to use power well. Right. That's the superhero motif. That's the uh, if we just had a godly president motif, that's a, you know, whatever um, that the, the idea that we can somehow use worldly power for God's purposes. That is a very alluring proposition to the American church these days. Yeah. Um, and so a guy named David Fitch wrote a book, Reckoning with Power where he argues there, there are actually two different powers. Um, there's worldly power or what he calls power over. And then he said, there's another power called power with or power under. And it's, it is godly power. It's what the power that God uses that Jesus exemplifies and that the church is to embrace. And it's a, it's a really big point because there's a lot of Christian writing on, Hey, let's use our leverage, our resources, our privileges, for the sake of the other, um, and the way that we do that is through power over. So let's be politically active in power over ways. Let's legislate in power over ways. You know, let's write church statements in, in power over ways. Especially if we have the moral high ground, why wouldn't we exactly. insert that? And, and to... Yes, and, and even if it's done in the with the best of intentions, right. Fitch's point is that power over is not the power of God ever, ever. And that there is a small slice of human life where power over is, it can be used, but that does not bring about redemption. All it does is preserve life. Mm. It's the traffic light idea. You can't change hearts by having traffic lights, but it's certainly a great idea to have traffic lights and, and police officers who enforce them right. using power over, right? And so you take the abortion issue. And you have two totally different approaches. One approach says this is a preservation of life issue. And so let's legislate the thing because we're, preserve, we're preserving human life. So let's use the power of the sword slash government to power over and legislate because we're pursue, pre preserving human life here. I don't know why I'm having a hard time saying those words, preserving human life. For others, it's not a preserving of human life issue. It's more of a redemption change of heart issue. And, um, and so, so, and this is where, when, you know, when Roe v. Wade was was um, was overturned, you know, you and I were sitting there going, I, I don't I don't feel like celebrating this. Yeah. This, is, this feels like a bit like a setback because the argument against the 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 overturning and the preserving of life, the argument against that is um, at the best, at the best, you mandate certain things that are happening in culture and certain human human children are saved but they're not necessarily saved into um, great environments or whatever. I mean, they're, you know, abortion still could happen uh, and, and probably will. And we haven't done anything. We've just traffic light abortion. Yes. We haven't yeah. done anything to, to adapt to why it is that abortion is attractive to begin with the, the, the social safety nets around single moms and young moms and contraception. And so, you know, you and I were saying there is another power to be appealed to here. It's not just power over that legislates abortion away, but it's also providing a counter narrative 
where where human life and single moms are taken taken care of so well yeah. that abortion ceases to be an attractive option. Yeah. Maybe as attractive as it currently is. And so this is where this really plays out in real time. You know, you take the a gun issue or race issue or whatever. Uh, a lot of the appeals are to, well, let's, let's power over, let's legislate. And, um, and, and there is a whole sub segment uh, that Fitch, you know, is referring to, and that I think you and I would probably find ourselves more at home with saying, okay, power overing doesn't bring about the redemptive purposes of God. It right. might preserve life, but it doesn't transform a thing. So if all we have in the world is power over, we're stuck yeah. because all power over is going to do is create the need for more power over. So we've been trying to present a biblical case for the fact that there are two definitions of power. One is power over people, the power of coercion. Um, it can be expressed in expertise. Remember, like if you have power of knowledge that I don't have, right? I submit myself to your power. Um it can be it can be embedded in social systems. So there are sanctions in the lunchroom. You know, no one's going to eat with me if I do X, Y, or Z or whatever. Um, but power under or power with is the idea of it's the power of weakness, the power of cooperation, the power of relationship, and that that's a legitimate way of getting things done in the world. Mm -hmm. And so when the Christian Church only imagines that power over is the only option then we limit actually the surprising things that God can do. It's like the Ku Klux Klan. You can, like our, the, the, the black African-American man that we talk about all the time yeah. who met with hundreds of Ku Klux Klan members. You could, you could legislate against the Ku Klux Klan. Absolutely. It's vile. It's abhorrent. Let's legislate that these things aren't, don't exist. They don't get funding, blah, 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 blah. They're sanctions, whatever. But then this guy does not allow power over to be the only power at work. And so yeah. through the power of relationship and connection and forgiveness and kindness, right? He wins people over and hangs their hoods yeah. when they forsake the clan. He hangs their hoods right in his house or something. Yes, his closet. Yes. Or Martin Luther King Jr. Like the, the, the power of nonviolence. That's a, that's a real power in the world. Yeah. And in the church in America, in the way that we structure church and the way that we see pastors and the way that we like, we're so infatuated with power over. And we think the only issue is whether or not the right people have it and the right cultures prevent it from being abused yeah. and Fitch's point, And I think the point of the text is we got to forsake it all together. Always. Yeah. There's never a time to use power over in the church ever. We are, we are a people of power with, and that is our only, that's the only pitch we've got. You would say it's so, cursed form? I mean, it does fit. <laughs> You're genius of bringing that question up. So, Paul. Paul. Man, Paul preached. Paul. Let's talk about Paul's leadership principles for spiritual leadership. And so... It was me, with me, brothers and sisters, when I came with to you, I did not come with eloquence or human wisdom, <laughs> as I proclaimed to you the testimony about God. I think that's our, like, our mission verse for the podcast. I think very much so. <laughs> yes, if you're looking for eloquence or human wisdom, nope. <laughs> for I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. And again... That's not just saying the message, but he's, he's saying the socially shamed Jesus yes. Christ. Yes. Not the Jesus in, with his sword, not the Jesus in his horse. This is the socially shamed Jesus. Yeah. I came to you in a weakness with great fear and trembling. All right, we can do that. Yeah. My message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power, so that your faith might not rest on human wisdom, but on God's power. Mm. Right? So how does Paul make room for God's power? Right? By forsaking any attempt yeah, to manipulate, yeah. persuade, be eloquent, like any attempt to win them over in capitalistic terms, he just simply says, no, I'm going to sit here in weakness and in um, non-eloquence, whatever word that would be. <laughs> I think you just doubt it. <laughs> I did, Yeah, exactly. I'm just embodying. <laughs> so your faith might not rest on human wisdom, but on God's power. I mean, man, where's that? What's that leadership principle called? I don't know. 
right? Paul, so, and, and the reason he's talking about eloquence is because, because he, Paul keeps choosing the lowest social status in his approach to these churches. So to the Corinthians, there were these rhetoricians that were, uh, they made a living doing this and they were well known and they were really, really great at, at speaking and eloquence. And they come in after Paul and they just dazzle everybody with their verbal, you know, skill. Paul wasn't super impressive. And, and, and Paul, like he says, I could have asked you for money, but I, I worked as a manual laborer, which was a socially shameful mm. situation to the Corinthians. And he did it so that they would not be impressed with him socially, but rather with the power of the message and the power of God. And so this is what it looks like to be cruciform, right? This is what it looks like when, like you could either dazzle or you could rest on God's power. You can't do both. Mm. And, and one of the reasons why the American church sees so little of God's power is because we, we're infatuated with our own. Yeah. Right? So, so Paul, man, I mean, rhetorically, this is so genius. So Paul is like, okay, guys, I know you love these other super apostles. He calls them super apostles. <laughs> and, and he's like, and so you want to compare resumes? Okay, let's compare resumes. And then, he, then he's like, but I'm an idiot for even talking like this, but let's play just because you're so infatuated with this. So he says later in 2 Corinthians, I do not think I am in the least inferior to those super apostles. I may indeed be untrained as a speaker, but I do have knowledge. We have made this perfectly clear to you in every way. Was it a sin for me to lower myself in order to elevate you by preaching the gospel of you to you free of charge? Now, do you see what he's saying there? I lowered myself by being a tent maker to elevate you so that it would be free. But they, they hold this against him. Yeah, right. He says, I robbed other churches by receiving support from them so mm -hmm. as to serve you. And when I was with you and needed something, I was not a burden to anyone there. For the brothers who came from Macedonia supplied what I needed. I've kept myself from being a burden to you in any way, and I will continue to do so. I repeat, this is a little later, let no one take me for a fool. But if you take me for a fool, then tolerate me just as you would a fool so that I may do a little boasting. Hmm. In this self-confident boasting, I'm not talking as the Lord Jesus would, but as a fool. But since you are boasting the way the world does, I too will boast that way. <laughs> you gladly put up with fools since you are so wise. In fact, you even put up with anyone who enslaves you or exploits you or takes advantage of you and puts on airs or slaps you in the face. To my shame, I admit that we were too weak for that. Whatever anyone else dares boast about, I am speaking like a fool. I also dare boast about it. Are those super apostles? Are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they Abraham's descendants? So am I. Are they servants of Christ? And I am out of my mind to talk like this. I am more. I have worked much harder, been in prison more frequently, been flogged more severely, been exposed to death again and again five times. I received from the Jews the 40 lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods, once pelted with stones, three times shipwrecked. I spent a night and a day in the open sea. I've been constantly on the move and been in danger from rivers, in danger from bandits, in danger from my fellow Jews, in danger from Gentiles, in danger in the city, in the country, at sea, in danger from false prophets. I've labored and toiled and have often gone without sleep. I've known hunger and thirst and have often gone without food. I've been cold and naked. Besides everything else, I face daily the pressure of my concern for all the churches. Who is weak? And I do not feel weak. Who is led into sin? And I do not inwardly burn. If I must boast, I will boast of the things that show my weakness. Hmm. So instead of lauding all of his credentials over the Corinthians to put these super apostles in their place, place right? That would be power. The power over move is here's yeah. the flex. I'm right? I met with Jesus. Yeah, I'm freaking Paul. <laughs> I'm freaking Paul writing most of the New Testament, just so we're clear. Instead, he postures himself as under them so that he might come alongside them and not stand over them. So he boasts of all the suffering, all the persecution, all the times he's been hurt and disappointed, all the grief, right? He refuses to demand support from the churches. And then all the time he talks about all of his co-laborers. He's never talking about people as his servants or people as his helpers. 
he, they're always co-laborers, they're brothers, mm -hmm. they're sisters. Right. He's just always elevating. Or, or if he's not elevating them, he's de-elevating himself. Paul, a slave of Jesus. Mm -hmm. Later on in 2 Corinthians. <laughs> I mean, this is, where was all of this in my leadership class? Right. I have a friend, Paul said in 2 Corinthians 11, who was raised up to the third heaven. I have a friend. This is a you know very ancient way of saying, it's me. And I had <laughs> incredible revelations up in the third heavens. I can't even describe them. But my friend, to keep, him, friend. Keep, to keep him from becoming conceited, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away, but he said to me, and this very famous, non-practiced, non-really believed in statement, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in your weakness. Or my power is perfected when yours comes to its end, in other words. So here's where that martyrdom stuff starts to get confusing, I think. Yep, let me finish this yeah, and yeah. then we'll hit it. You got it. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, so that Christ's power may rest on me. Where does Christ's power rest? In his weakness. Right? So, so Paul uh, continues boasting and then says, let me tell you about my ultimate boast. My ultimate boast is there's this thing that's tormenting me that I can't get rid of. I think my chair that, just broke. That <laughs> you're, is that what was happening? I was yeah, wondering what I'm was sorry. happening yeah. over there. All of a sudden, it's going, boom, and I start going back. <laughs> real time, so, real talk. Uh, dude, it's... Yeah, without eloquence or power, what was oh, it? Now we're blurry. We're zero for two, now, and now you're blurry, ladies and gentlemen. This is this, this is, is spiritual attack. text right here. Yep, there we are. <laughs> so, so Paul, and I mean, and he says this other places too. When he talks about you know all of his social prestige as a Pharisee is rubbish compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Jesus. Um, Paul is constantly, constantly. Uh, t invited to use power over in his churches, and he just simply does it. And if you're watching YouTube right now, Tim is blurry. Um, and and maybe that's the normal mode for Tim. But there's a metaphor anyway, in there he's, somewhere. He's back. So so you have Jesus saying to his disciples, "Listen, you know how the Gentiles lorded over each other. Not so with you." There's something else you do. And man, in Paul, you really get a sense of what that looks like in a church context. Mm -hmm. So, so power, so power with can only be embraced if you actually believe that the way of Jesus gets things done in the world. And even if it didn't, it's still the most faithful way of being human and, and honoring the, the pattern set before us by Christ. And so there's this surrender that has to happen. If, I, if I'm actually going to self-expend rather than hoard or claim my rights and entitlements, I have to believe something about God in the world. Yeah, I have to almost come under God's reign in order for me to trust that power with won't crush me. You know what I mean? Because mm -hmm. it's just so easy out of fear to look at the world and say, nope, I've got to really fight for my right to party because no one else is going to do that, you know? Um, and so there's this shift that has to take place where in order to forsake power over, I actually have to come under God's reign and rule and believe things about him in the world yeah. so that I can now do power with when I don't have to always get my way. I don't always have to be right. I don't always have to have... Um, the last word. Now, the question then we have to answer um, is, can Christians ever use power over? Mm -hmm. And not surprisingly, there are loads of answers to this uh, question. <laughs> yes, no, maybe. Yeah. Well, yes. And then there are different reasons why. And then we're going to argue no. <laughs> so can Christians ever use power over? So one answer is, well, yes, of course. That's the only kind of power there is. 
So of course, Christians should be the ones using power over because how else right. are we going to get justice? Right? How else are we going to see racial equality? How else are we going to see God's agenda move forward in the world? Of course, Christ Christians are the people most trustworthy with power over. Right. Well, and, and yeah, and we would say, well, yeah, not not really. I don't I, I don't think of I can't think of many examples where a Christian was entrusted with power over and handled that well. Yeah. Um, and, and we think again, I, and this is just repeating something we've already said. In Christian culture, we think if we just find the right person with the right character, or we find right. the right environment with the right culture, then we can use power over. Yeah. Fitch's counter to that is, it's the use of power over that's the issue. Power yeah. over corrupts. Yes, That's the point. It's not, is there a good person, or is there a good cause, or is there a good culture? It's no, we're not supposed to use power over, period. All right, so first answer is, well, we are supposed to use power over because it's the only kind of power there is. Second answer is yes, godly power only works at the level of individual souls. Worldly power works because of humans are sinful and it's the only way to get things done in the world. And so this is kind of a Lutheran two kingdoms vision where God is the God of the human heart and his power works to transform the human heart. But God doesn't have a lot of a lot of uh, a lot of a lot of uh, power to expend towards justice um, or you know military affairs or nonviolence or whatever. Like there, it's just this separation of the powers where God's power is the power that just transforms the human heart into Jesusness, and then because there are low, a lot of people who aren't Jesus people, we have to use worldly power over right. because you know what I mean. And obviously, like, there is a place where coercive power does restrain evil. Mm -hmm. But it's, but it's, should that ever be employed by the church is the question. Um, another answer to this, which is a variation to number two is, well, yeah, we have to use, we have to use power over because humans are evil and they'll only respect power over. Yeah. They won't respect power under or power with. They'll just take advantage of it. Like you mm -hmm. can sit in a church meeting and pray for me while I'm shooting people. Right. Um, right. But I mean, come on, guys. Like, how about the cops that show up there? Or really, you're going to be at a Christian school and you're just going to stand there and say, bless you while, while somebody's shooting mm -hmm. um, Christian kids. Right. I mean, or, or are we grateful for the first responders that got there and killed the person? Right. And so. You know, for some in the history of Christian theology, power over is a given. You just, it's what, it's what is true in a fallen world. And um, there's a guy named um, Reinhold Niebuhr, Niebuhr, I think is how you pronounce it. But um, the ethic of Jesus, uh, here's a quote, has nothing to say about the uh, relativities of politics and economics, nor of the necessary balances of power which exist and must exist even in the most intimate social relationships. For Niebuhr, Jesus with all his power is impotent for engaging the injustices at work in the modern world. Um, uh, and, and so, you know, what we're suggesting is, eh, I think maybe that's, that's a little, a little, that lacks a little imagination. Yeah. Um, but but we see this view of power when social activists can only picture dealing with injustice at the legislative level mm -hmm. um, and not the grassroots level. We see this when churches say, listen, we've got to fight for Christian morality at, at, the, at the ballot box. And that's the only place we do that. Yeah. Or we see this when a pastor goes from a plurality of elders to, nope, I'm the king. Right. Um, cause all these people are coming to Jesus and we just have to make it efficient and effective. Yeah. Don't rock the boat. Don't rock the boat. And, and there, you know, there are case studies of what power over does, you know, to Christians. I mean, and obviously the former president's one of those in 2016, right, right when the, right when the, the campaign first kicked off, um, Trump was at Dort college and said this, I remember hearing this. And this is a quote, I will tell you, Christianity is under tremendous siege, whether we want to talk about it or we don't want to talk about it. 
Um, according to him, the Christians made up, make up the overwhelming majority of the country and quote, yet we don't exert the power that we should have. Wow. Trump promised that if he were elected president, things would change. He gestured to the crowd, waving his index finger, promising Christianity will have power quote. If I'm there, you're going to have somebody representing you very, very well. Remember that. And, you know, I can understand in a world where Christians are feeling like they like traditional, morality or marriage or whatever is under threat and that that there are other agendas being forced upon them in public schools. I can understand conceptually where an appeal like that um, would, would be appealing. Um, the problem is whenever you use worldly power to achieve, quote, godly ends, um, you push people further away from God. You don't bring them because that power has no power to redeem. It only has the power to force. Mm -hmm. And forcing people, I don't know if you know this, forcing people really doesn't win over their hearts. I mean, that's at least kind of, I don't know, maybe that's true. Um, it certainly is when my wife tries to force me to pick up my laundry. Um, my heart is not won over. Um, so what we, would, what we would say is, you know, all around Jesus, Jesus was constantly being tempted to use power over. Um, the Romans, I mean, there were factions of fellow Jews who were saying, listen, we actually need to respond to yeah. violence, um, here. Um, Palestine was under Roman occupation. Um, in, and there were insurrectionist groups popping up all over the place in the name of Yahweh to take on Rome using violence. And I mean, the Jewish people, quite honestly, expected that Jesus, worth he was, if he really was the Messiah, would actually do something with power over in dealing with Rome. Even his disciples, you know, thought that when they came into, like they, when, when they ask, "Hey, Jesus, when you come into your kingdom, can I sit at the right and left hand?" They mean, when you go to Jerusalem and deal with the Romans, can I? Can I sit at the victory table with you? Like, right. that's not a neutral question. That's a, I mean, so everybody expected Jesus to come with power over. And, um, and, and from Jesus washing uh, their feet to his reject, rejecting of Satan's temptations to healing diseases the way he healed them. Um, I mean, it was just one big repudiation of power over. They're just, there isn't, I mean, the only time Jesus seemed to exercise power over was the demonic, where he would command, um, he would command demons to leave. And they, he didn't invite them, he commanded them and they left. But in, in almost every other instance, the power he's manifesting is power, that, like, that's why the faith of people mattered. He wasn't just coercing people and healing them, but their faith and their response and their participation mattered. That's why, you know, he never healed the same way all the time. It was totally depending on the person. And, and so you just have, even, even in this manifesting of God's power, it's still done. You know, I only do what the father tells me to do. I, I am filled with the spirit of, of the father and, and can do those things. Um, even, even, you know, in the, the, the most, I don't know, compelling, miraculous uses of his power. It wasn't power over. It was still just power with. It's like, it's like, why doesn't he just multiply loaves and fishes out of thin air? Instead, why does he say, well, hey guys, how many loaves and fishes do you guys have? Why don't we multiply those? You know what I mean? Like yeah, instead of just producing wine yeah. out of nowhere, he's like, hey, how much, how much water do we got? Yeah. Right. It's always cooperative. It's always with the people, always with the humans. Rarely does he just do it by divine fiat. And so I don't know how we can look at the example of Jesus, the example of Paul, and say power over is a legitimate option for the church. Right. Um, now, the, the counter, of course, is, well, hey, what about Romans 13, right? Doesn't it say, let every every person be subject to the governing authorities. There's every no authority cycle. Except, except from God. And those authorities exist that exist have been instituted by God and they've been, you know, given the power of the sword. And so a bunch of things we would say in response to this, first of all, this is the limiting of worldly power. This isn't, this isn't an, endo an endorsement of worldly power. This isn't like, Hey guys, 
um, we're big fans of this. This is, this is, hey, worldly power, stay in your lane. You literally only can coerce. Yeah. You literally, the only power you have is the power to compel. You've got your and treasure. that does nothing. That does, exactly. That does nothing to accomplish the p- uh, purposes of God in the world. Yeah. So yes, and I'm grateful that we have lawyers and legal systems and school boards and governments. And I'm grateful that we live where we live. And I'm grateful that there are police. And I'm grateful that there are people who keep our country safe. I'm grateful for that. Because that has a role in in fallen human life. Mm -hmm. But when the church exercises power, it should look nothing like any of that or any of those examples. So that'd be a good conversation maybe next week or something to have about exactly what you just said briefly that we live in a world that is taking lefts and rights and going crazy. And we do have war and military and police and all these things. And so when we talk about there's two ways to do things, pick the right one. Obviously there's a, you know, truckload of discernment with what that actually looks like. So you and French had a little bit of that back and forth during your Holy Post thing. Right. Um, which was really interesting because he obviously served in the military, has a very unique vantage point in that conversation about yeah, violence and war and what is justified and what isn't. So it's yeah. like, yeah. just to put the flesh and blood back into it again, I think that'd be an interesting thing to kind of peruse. Like, what does that look? And you've given an example of the um, guy that was on meth and attacked the, the athletic trainer at your daughter's. Yeah. Uh, thing yep. and how you had to restrain him, but yep. not in like you didn't, I don't know. So there's a lot in there. I think that's like totally. Absolutely. And Jesus, always, I think this is why the cruciform thing is so confusing, but also so compelling is it is yeah. asking you to do a large participatory thing in the journey and the vision of Jesus, not just that's be like, it. that's Jesus it. didn't walk around from town to town and be like, Hey, t- let me come into your yeah. heart, which would have been freaky. And right. then we'll be done here and I'll move on to the next town and do the same thing again. It was like, no, this invitation into like a full embodiment and change, of course. Exactly. And, 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 you know, I used to be a chaplain for um, a police department in the city I worked in that had a huge gang problem, huge violence problem. And I got in the middle of riots and assaults and I never tried to hurt anybody, but I would physically restrain. Yeah. And I, obviously there's a place for that, but it's when the church in its moral imagination, can only picture cultural influence using the the power of the sword as embodied yep. in legislation or government. We have we have we have left our calling. We've become idolatrous, and now we think we're we can handle worldly power. And we've demonstrated beyond a shadow of a doubt. If two thousand years of church history hasn't shown us anything, <laughs> it's shown us this. Yeah, and that's the getting that, off your cross thing that, that you say, right? Like, yes, that patters, patter, pastors will be abusers, that scandals, that secrets will become scandals, and that power over is to be forsaken at all costs. Yeah. Now. Next week, we're going to talk about how the church structures itself so that power over is the only power that's on display mm. and what churches should do in response to that. Right. <laughs> that and I, fun. and I've, <laughs> and I've benefited from both. I've been the, the apex with mm-hmm. the special parking space and the yep. security team and the shower in my office and all the perks. And I loved it. Yeah. And, um, and I've seen also how corrupting all of that is personally. You know, Um, and so there is a conversation where it's not just enough that the church stop grabbing for worldly power to try to use it for God's purposes. That because that that is corruptive and it and it actually pushes people farther away from God. Yeah, but it's that the American church structures itself with power over at its center. Yes. So that we have a senior pastor who leads an organization with flow charts and organizations and budgets and all manner of expressions of power over. Yeah. Even in the way we evangelize, we're d- putting power over on display. Yeah. So to forsake forsake power over in a church s- sounds a lot harder or is a lot harder than it sounds totally. yeah. because our churches are structured with this view of power yep. that just the right people in the right culture keep us safe. And yep. that's not it. So... As Seth Uri is about to sing in 15 minutes, you lift me up. <laughs> That's it. 
Beautiful. You're beautiful. Your face is beautiful. Um, all right, ladies and gentlemen, we got a heart out. So um, we're going to take our bacon grease and go. We're going to take our <laughs> eloquence and our wisdom and, um, and turn you back over to your regularly scheduled programming. <laughs> so thanks for being awesome. Thanks for letting us be a part of your life. Thanks for all the encouragement. Thanks for uh, those of you that support us. Thanks for that. Um, thanks for Tim. Thanks for Mike. Thanks for Mike. Yeah. Thanks for Seth. I love now the emails. It used to be Mike, you know, and Tim and Seth or Tim, Mike and Seth. And then it was Seth, Mike and Tim. And now it's just Seth. The and then Prince like, Dear Seth. other guys. <laughs> and the <laughs> two, yeah. And, and yeah, yeah. And the two lesser, lesser important guys. Perfect. Anyway, friends, um, to be continued, rock on. Keep on rocking in the free world. Oh, there we go. There it is. See ya. Bye. <laughs>